Ohio. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, December 23rd, 2018. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is 937-323-7508. Tomorrow, uh, December 24th, we have a 6.30 and 9.30 service. Uh, candlelight service for Christmas Eve and at 9 o'clock there will be uh, the bell choir will play before the 9.30 service. St. John's has a food pantry open Wednesdays 9 to 10.45. Outreach store open Monday through Friday 9.30 to 1. Rainbow table on Friday from noon to 1. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning as we celebrate the fourth and final Sunday of Advent for tomorrow night, Christmas Eve. So we welcome you back tomorrow night for our Christmas Eve celebrations. Uh, we welcome everyone and give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield and Clark County area or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make St. John your new church home. We begin by preparing our hearts and minds for worship with the order of confession and forgiveness. So I'd ask that you please turn to page 94 in the front of the red worship hymnal in your views. And I invite those who can do so without difficulty to please stand.
Jackson will be doing the readings. The first reading this morning is from Micah, chapter 5. But you, the Bethlehem of Ephrathah, you are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, you shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. burn off. 
offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, See, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And thank you again for the last week with your outstanding tonight. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Two men were going sailing two weeks before the celebration of Christmas. And as they maneuvered their sailboat into the bay, the one fellow turned to the other and said, this sure beats Christmas shopping, doesn't it? Unfortunately, many people have developed a similar attitude towards Christmas. A time, a season that is supposed to be a season of joy and celebration has come for some people a season of drudgery, anxiety, overcrowded stores, and overpriced how do we change back to a Christmas act? How, what must we do and able to not be cynical about Christmas or to think that doing some other pleasure is better than preparing for Christmas itself? To answer that, we must go back to our gospel lesson today and learn from Mary the Mother of Rose. For in Mary's response to her cousin Elizabeth, she gives us the steps we need to have a Christmas attitude, the proper Christmas attitude. As many of you know, Mary's response is known as the Magnificat. That comes from a Latin word for magnify, which is how we translate into English. The church has always held the Magnificat in a special place, and including putting it into the evening prayer service, or what we used to commonly refer to as a Vesper service. It's one of the main uh, liturgical parts of evening prayer of the Vespers. Because in this Magnificat, Mary is outlining that Christmas day. So we return to our gospel lesson and beginning with verse 26, Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord. The word magnify. As I said, it is a Greek word translation, a Latin word that means to declare great. My soul declares great God. It means to show the greatness of someone. My soul is showing the greatness of God. It means to esteem one highly. All of us should esteem God highly. No matter whether we're a Christian or in some other religion, every person should esteem God highly. It means esteeming God and not ourselves. That's pretty difficult today when society encourages us to look out for ourselves. When society tells us to only do those things that give us instant gratification. Some have looked at society today and referred to it as the microwave society. We want something to happen instantly. If it doesn't happen instantly, we don't want to have to mess with it. We don't want to be involved in it. Yet here this word magnify means we esteem God higher than ourselves. We recognize God is God and we are his creation. God is not our creation. He created us. And the word means to tell of God's greatness. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are to tell of the greatness of God to everyone we meet. To have a proper Christmas attitude, we magnify God. But the problem is that even in the church today, in some congregations, you have, and some denominations as a whole, in their publications and so forth, instead of magnifying God, esteeming God, uplifting God, acknowledging God, they spend their time tearing down God. They spend their time denying the power of God. They doubt his word and try to say, well, God didn't really mean that. That's not appropriate for today. We're a different culture. 
so on and so forth, all kinds of excuses to belittle the power, sovereignty, and almightiness of God. If that is your attitude, of course you're not going to have a Christmas attitude. You're going to be persuaded by society and the things around you. You're going to lose focus. So it's, and I can guarantee you, tomorrow night, there will be some congregations throughout America and where the preacher, instead of proclaiming the good news of the birth of Jesus Christ, instead of talking about the impact of the birth of Jesus Christ, are going to sit there and give me this long diatribe about what Luke says here is wrong and what Luke said there is impossible and, and the shepherds wouldn't have gone into the manger and all kinds of other excuses. Instead of proclaiming, Jesus Christ. So if the church is having a bad Christmas attitude, what can we expect from people? And so we must, instead of focusing on society, instead of focusing on overcrowded stores and uh, overpriced items, we should be like Mary and Elizabeth, magnifying God. Esteeming God. Esteeming God in ourselves. Telling others of the mighty acts of God. That is the first step to having a Christian attitude. To know who God is and what He has done and rejoice over that every day. Second step, verse 47. Mary says, And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Rejoice. This is a Greek word that actually is like a lot of words in Hebrew and Greek is a picture word. It actually is describing something. In English we just describe it as rejoice, but in Greek it is an image of a colt or a newborn or a calf or a baby lamb out in a pasture that is Leaping, jumping, and skipping for joy. If you grew up on a farm with animals, you witnessed this. I saw it happen. See, dad skipping and jumping and leaping in joy. Saw little lambs do it. Saw horses do it. So it's describing that we as people should be like those young animals. Skipping, leaping, and jumping for joy. It also means to exalt. So Mary is saying, my soul exalts in the Lord. My soul is so happy in God and in the Lord that I leap and jump and skip for joy. Because there is nothing greater. But again, too many people, instead of rejoicing over God and what He has done, rejoice over those earthly things that do not matter. Rejoice over those earthly things that moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Instead of rejoicing that Jesus, they're trying to find their rejoicing in earthly things. Yet it is Jesus who enables us to rejoice even in difficult times. It is Jesus who enables us to rejoice even in the midst of trial, tragedy, and tribulation. It is Jesus who enables us to rejoice in times of joy and celebration. But we have to focus on Him. We have to exalt Him. We have to esteem Him. He enables us to rejoice in the good and the bad. And so we can have the proper Christmas attitude. No matter the situation. And in the third step, This is the most difficult step. Because people today in the church are told, it's fine, you want to worship Jesus, but do it on Sunday, and then Monday to Saturday, make sure you like him in the closet and don't bring him out. We don't want to hear about him during the week. Well, that's not what Christians are supposed to do. We are to declare the good news. That's the third step. To have a proper Christmas attitude is we declare the good news. 
Verse 50, Mary says, And his mercy is for those who fear him. Now you may be saying, now how is that telling the good news? He has mercy for those who fear him. Well, we will find out in a moment how that is declaring the good news. Because what Mary is doing there is declaring the good news. He has mercy on those who fear him. People develop bad Christmas attitudes because they concentrate on the wrong things. Presence. This today, like every year, I had to go out and finish my Christmas shopping. You know, Christmas shopping season started, what, back in November? And I, like every year, I say, I'm going to get done early, and every year, it's the day before Christmas Eve, and I'm finishing up my Christmas shopping. Many people have some focus on the present. I've got to get the right present. i got to do, buy a better present than my brother or sister are going to buy for mom and dad. And i got to outdo somebody. I parties. People spend their time focusing on parties and what kind of party they're going to have. You, know, you drove around town all through the month of November uh, and early December you went by the restaurants and the bars and lounges and they said, book your holiday party here. Uh, so people get hung up on that. That causes you to lose, they develop a wrong attitude during Christmas. Decorations. Keeping up with your neighbor or with your family members in decorating your house for Christmas. Some years ago, there was a movie, I forget the name of it, but it was starred Danny DeVito and Matthew Broderick. And they were neighbors. And they were in a competition every year to outdo each other in decorating their house that summer. The goal was to make their house so bright you didn't see it from outer space. And so the whole movie is about this crazy competition and what they do to each other, trying to sabotage each other and so forth. And finally at the end, uh, they kind of have a truce that work together and they make all these lights and sure enough, the astronauts in the space shuttle see it from outer space. Decorating your house is not what Christmas is about. Getting bent all the shit out, out of shape because your neighbor has more decoration than you do is not Christmas. Or what Christmas is about. And that will cause you to have the wrong Christmas attitude. I thought about it, but then decided against it. Because I figured too many of you would return an empty paper. But I thought about handing you out a paper and having you answer this question. What is the true impact of the first Christmas? Or do you uh, put it this way, do you understand the impact of that first Christmas? I have a feeling for those of you who would answer, you would probably give me all kinds of answers except the correct one. That's why I think most of you would just give me a blank piece of paper. And not risk it. Most people think the impact of Christmas is the sentimentality about a cute little baby being born and placed in a manger. The impact of Christmas is not about a cute little baby being born, because cute little babies are born every day. You, know, you can go across the street to the hospital and go to the um, floor for babies. I think I have three kids, I don't still remember what the floor is called, but anyhow, go to the nursery. And look at all the cute little babies that are there. That wasn't the impact of Christmas. The impact of Christmas is the fact that although this baby was born naturally through the mother, it was a supernatural conception, and therefore it was a different birth than any that have ever happened. And it's all centered around the old Latin word, incarnation. Incarnation. That is the impact of that first Christmas. Incarnation means God taking on human flesh, God revealing himself in human form and life. Not God coming down from heaven and just walking around a little bit and seeing what's going on and then jumping back up into heaven. The Greek
Greeks and the Romans had all kinds of stories about the gods and goddesses of Olympus coming down from Olympus and coming to Greece and Rome and interacting with normal people. And then when things start getting hot or things start getting a little uncomfortable, they just jump back up to Mount Olympus. And they never stop being the god or goddess. Incarnation means God literally taking on human flesh and interacting with us so that we may know who he really is and what he is really like. So that we will know he is not a policeman sitting up there in heaven waiting for us to step out of line and then zapping us as soon as we do. He's not an old grandpa sitting in a rocking chair with a long white beard just rocking away time until he decides to send Jesus back to earth. Instead, taking on flesh and blood, he lived among us full of grace and truth. And in they held everything that you and I know, even death itself. Growing up, I always understood that Jesus was Son of God and Son of Man. I knew Jesus' humanity in the suffering on the cross, and that their passion and death were real, and that he suffered the same pain as anybody else who went through that horrible form of execution. But I never thought about Jesus in his in daily life and how he was like you and me in his daily life until the 10th grade when my Sunday school teacher uh, started talking about the humanity of Jesus and actually he really understood what that meant. And he started talking about things like, asking his questions like, do you, do you realize Jesus had to blow his nose? I never thought about Jesus blowing his nose. I thought he was perfect, so why would he be in sinus trouble? Or I never thought of him having to clear his throat and spit, flip out or whatever. I never thought about him possibly developing blisters on his feet from sandals that didn't fit right as he was walking from place to place. I didn't think about him having to take a bath, get dressed, comb his hair, trim his beard, do all those things that we had to do, did But he did. Because it was incarnation. God truly coming into human flesh to experience the human condition, what human life was like. And he avoided none of it. There is one of the Gospels that didn't make it into the canon. And in this gospel, it describes the death of Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. And it talks about Jesus being at the grave of Joseph and weeping over the death of his father. And because it wasn't his time yet for his public ministry, he was not allowed to raise Joseph from the dead. Like later on, he rose Lazarus. And he raised the widow named Sons who were carrying him out to the cemetery. And so there we see that he met. See, he even suffered sorrow and grief of losing someone he loved. And of course, then he suffered death. So this is the greatest impact of that first Christmas is the incarnation. God showing us what he's really like. That he loves us so much that he sent his only son to suffer and die for us on the cross to pay the debt of sin that we have. And so because of that, Mary, knowing that she's going to be the mother of the Savior of the world, says, and his mercy is for those who fear him. The word mercy means compassion. It means, primary meaning is, love towards those in misery due to guilt and sin. The human condition. Unless we are a psychopath, that's the only term, someone like a Hitler or Stalin or a Che Guevara or a Tiller the Hun and all these people through history who just kill people and then not bad not. Um, with Hitler, is unbelievable, he was a vegetarian because he thought it was wrong to kill him. 
Wrong to kill them, but you can slaughter them. millions of people. That's okay. Because they have no conscience. And there are people like that. We see criminals like that who murder people. They have no conscience, no remorse. But the majority of us have a conscience. And when we do something wrong, whether we're a believer or not, do something wrong, we have guilt. We know we've done something. We know there's going to be repercussions. Or we try to figure out how can I make up for that hurt that I just did or that wrong that I just did. For those of us who are believers, not only do we see that as doing something wrong, we recognize it as sin. And so the guilt of sin is on us, bothering us, until we remember. That Jesus took that sin and guilt to the cross. And that he has paid the debt for it in full. And we can have our conscience relieved knowing that we have forgiveness from God. And that promise of everlasting life. So Mary is rejoicing over the fact, sharing the good news with us, that God loves us and cares for us because we are in misery due to sin and guilt. The word fear means to be an awe. It means to revere. It is a Greek word for the Old Testament term designating people acceptable to God. Who are the people acceptable to God? Those who awe and reverence. Those who try as best they can with the help of the Holy Spirit to do His will. And so this is the good news that we are to Shared. All in reverence for those of us who grew up with confirmation class in the small catechism. We remember the first commandment. It's all based on the first commandment. I'm the Lord your God, you shall have another God. No other gods before. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust God above all things. Fear. It's the same word. Not mean that you're cowering in a corner somewhere. Not go hiding in the closet so that God won't see you. Not being like my little sister, myself, on, on the farm when we were ready to leave on Sunday and our big sister told us we were violating the, the commandment of honoring God. Remembering the Sabbath day, we better run to the garage and put our rings up, maybe God won't see us yet. It's not that kind of fear. To me, it's that all in reverence for God. <coughs> In this nation, this society, used to have that reverence for God. We used to revere God and His Word in every point. If you go back and read the writings of Americans in the 16th, 17th, or in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries, you see this reverence for God. You see how God is revered. The presidents, the Supreme Court justices, the outstanding senators and congressmen, they were always talking about God and the importance of God in this nation. President Washington, his farewell address, said something to the effect that if this nation loses God, the nation will perish. First Chief Justice of the Supreme Court who helped write the Bill of Rights in the First Amendment, said that without God, our democracy could never succeed. So we had that reference for that. But now, especially as Christians, society doesn't revere God and makes fun of God. We see God portrayed horribly in movies, TV shows, radio, comedy, uh, CD comedies, uh, we see so-called artists taking symbols that are precious to us, like the Bible, or a crucifix, or a statue or icon of the Virgin Mary, and submerging them in all kinds of awful things, and calling it art, and giving it some real catchy, cheesy name, like there's some kind of great new Michelangelo, Michelangelo foam out of a studio. So reverence for God. If you have that reverence, then you'll have a proper Christmas attitude.
Christmas is far more than celebrating the birth of a baby. It is celebrating an event. And that is what we are losing sight of as each year goes by. It's not a baby, it's an event. It's God coming among us. God who is and was and always will be coming to us and living among us so that we will know who he really is and how much he loves us. Having a true Christmas attitude comes with understanding the truth of Christmas. And once we truly understand it sure does beat Christmas shop, doesn't it? Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds to Christ Jesus. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their need. Our response is here our prayer. Almighty God, we praise you that your Holy Spirit, Elizabeth greeted Mary as the mother of my Lord. While the newborn John leaped with joy in the presence your son in Mary's womb, increasing us your spirit, that by our faith we may bear fruit in abundance. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we praise you that from your conception you prepared prophets to proclaim your truth. Even so, we pray that you would prepare servants of the word today to preach your saving gospel with faithfulness and power. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we praise you for your Father of the fatherless, and that you provide for the poor when all others have forgotten them. Graciously, we over, watch over the hungry, the poor, the unemployed. Move us to serve you in showing mercy for all those in need, near and far. Comfort the grieving, 
heal the sick, and grant faith for the dying. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we praise you for the need of those in hunger that thirst for righteousness and the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, prepare us again to receive his sacrament in the true faith and faithfulness of the sinners and to strengthen the service for you and one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands we commend ourselves and all of whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will make, also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and host of heaven, we praise your name and join their in any hymn.
our Lord Jesus Christ and the precious blood, strengthen and preserve your true faith until life eternal. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift of faith toward you in fervent love, toward one another, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We conclude our celebration with verses 5 through 8 of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Hymn number 257 in the back of your worship. Hymn number 257, verses 5 through 8. Concludes our 10:30 service. Join us tomorrow evening at 6:30 and 9:30 for our candlelight service, and at 9 o'clock for the bell choir. Merry Christmas.